If you go with me to uh, chapter 9, and verse, starting at verse 9, we'll go 9 through 13. And Jesus passed, and as Jesus passed forth, hence he came, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And when it came to pass, as Jesus sat at the meat, it, let me try again. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the household, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, He eateth. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus and then Jesus heard what but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But I go, but I go ye and learn but go ye and learn what I meaneth, that I have mercy and not sacrifice. I have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not called, I am not come to call the righteous, but to sinners' repentance. Pardon my reading, the dyslexia is kicking in a little bit here. Follow me on the screen, I'll make it a little easier for you. Matthew 24, verses 21 through 27. And then, for then shall great tribulation, and then there shall be great tribulation, such as was, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, the, nor, no, nor shall be. But except those days shall be shortened, for there shall be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sakes the days shall be shortened. If any man... But if any, if any man shall say unto thee, Lo, where is Christ? For where is Christ? Or there shall believe not. And for there shall be arise false Christ and false prophets, which showeth great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would even deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore ye have said, Unto, wherefore they have sent unto you, behold, he is in the desert and shall not, will, before, so try it again, be, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth, behold, behold, he is in a secret chamber, believe not. Last verse, and as for lightning come, as, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even so to the west, so cometh so shall also come the Son of Man be. And we look at a very interesting scripture in light of what's happened this week. I have, uh, I have tried to temper my response to what's going on and what was said uh, by the Supreme Court. I, I will be completely honest with you and say... My flesh wanted to respond violently uh, to what I heard. But then in studying this and, and reading the word of God, it tempered my flesh to know that my kingdom is not here. The kingdom that I'm a part of, it doesn't, isn't man's kingdom. It is God's kingdom. And as I was doing this and I'm going about studying this, it, it, the, the thought dawned on me, the more I responded to my flesh, the more I responded to my own kingdom. I respond in the kingdom in which I live, I respond out of my flesh. But when I respond in the spirit, it's because I'm living in the kingdom of God and I respond out of that. So today's message and, and covering is the loyalty to the kingdom of God. We look at a, an interesting character in the word of God, Matthew. 
Now, Matthew is probably what we would consider the worst human being ever. He was an IRS agent. I'm sorry. But I, I, you know, I was talking to my wife last night, and it, it dawned on me, you know, it doesn't matter what I do, the IRS is there with me always. And I turn on the water, the IRS is there. I, I turn on the radio, the IRS, hey, I, they tax everything. I, I really would have a hard time praying for an IRS agent if he came into the church and asking God to heal him. For, I, let's be honest, you know, I, it, would be, it would be a little more difficult for me. I'm so thankful God has not allowed any IRS agents in here this morning. But if he had, I, I know God could save them because God has proven it. He did it with Matthew. And so there is something about the, the, the idea of taxes that just oh, irritate the fire out of me. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I realize by May 1st I'm finally done working for the government. And then the rest of it is, should be mine. But as, as more taxes are levied on, the more I realize, the more government I work for. Even though technically the government is my employer, it, it does make me a little irritated. But we find that in this we have a very unique character. Now, the Bible actually refers to Matthew in one part as Levi. It was, uh, it was who he was, but the scriptures change the, the context of Levi to Matthew, and Matthew is more is more how we understand who he was in the church, but Levi is who he was in the world. In other words, this Matthew or Levi, in his initial loyalties, was to the Roman Empire. So now, if you understand this, Ian, would you turn this down just a tad? It's it's ringing pretty bad. I, I've got a fairly heavy low end, and I can hear it. Um, Levi, when you became a publican, it was, you were a Jewish descent, but you pledged your allegiance to that Roman Empire as an agent of that empire. So your allegiance was to them. Now, this was not so bad in a sense until you realize as soon as you did something like that, you cut yourself off from the Jewish religion. You were not allowed in the synagogue. You were not allowed to worship in Jew. You, you, you totally took your, your loyalties from the Jewish faith and from the Jewish people and put them in the camp of the Roman Empire. Furthermore, as a publican, you were more likely identified as one who would line his own pockets after you had taken from those. So not only was he of a different empire, he was of his own self most likely. Most likely they made their, their money, they, they made their, their wages by extracting extra that was beyond the law to line their own pockets. Now there wasn't really much anybody could say or do about it because the Roman Empire didn't care as long as their coffers were full. They really didn't care what you did. And if you didn't pay, all he had to do was call a couple of guards. They came in, cleaned you out, and there, your life was gone. You were done. It's, it was that simple. It was, they, were, they were looked as, as very low on the totem pole of scum. You know, like here's pond scum. They're the ones that scrape the stuff off the belly of the pond scum, and that's what you were considered in that time. Two dynamic differences between the kingdom of self, the kingdom of the world, Levi, to the kingdom of God, and Matthew. Now, we don't know too much about Matthew in a sense of we understand that Matthew was a publican, but there isn't much that's said about him, but we can extract a lot from his understandings and from his readings and writings. But we, we, we do note is that as soon as he is translated, you, if you read in the book of Matthew, you will find that there's 46 times that he references the kingdom of God. He understood some, something about growing uh, or working for the government made him fully understand working for the kingdom of God. 
And so he begins to really show the church the loyalty that he has, not towards the kingdom of self or the kingdom of Rome, but to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of a servant. And so he makes a, a, a big change here. But you know what? If I looked, if I can be honest today, and I really look at what's going on in our world, loyalties are being challenged on every front. Uh, it, it's, I, I don't even know how to say this, but it, it just, it, I don't even have this concept because I grew up in church and my parents trained me in the word and, and put something in me that just said I need to be loyal to the things of God on a consistent basis. So I have a hard time wrapping my mind up around the fact that church is so just, uh, I don't even know how to say it, just kind of country club. There is no loyalties there. There's no, there's no sense of belonging or connecting with the church like it used to be. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you ever, I don't know about you, but I, I can remember growing up and talking to people and like, oh, that's the church I went to for 30 or 40 years. Or that's the church of my family. There was such a loyalty, such a tie to the church that is not there anymore. It, it's not, it's, it's so disconnected. And furthermore, loyalties in itself have died out. And I, look, I love social media. I get a lot of information for social media, but I don't have a lot of friendships because of social media. Okay? I have a lot of acquaintances of social media. Listen, if I'm on the street and my friend from Twitter is under attack, I'm probably going to let my friend from Twitter get taken out. But if I'm on the street and my brother's there with me, or somebody from this church is there with me and there's an attack on them, you better know that I'm stepping in. Why? Because there's a loyalty. There's, there's something that has been built. There's relationships that have been built. And loyalty isn't built in just, well, you know what? I know who you are, so I'm loyal to you because I just met you. Loyalties are built over time, over experiences, over shared experiences, over shared time together. I, there's, there's very few people in this world that I've spent more time with than the church body, than the people of God. I grew up in this church. My whole life has been, literally, except for, what, 17 or 18 months of my entire church life is when we lived in Florida. That was the only other time that we were never physically a part of this church. So my loyalties lie here. Why? Because I grew up here. My, my life is here. I, my children were dedicated here. I was married here. Why? All these things build a strong loyalty to the things of God and the people of God because I've spent time with them. I don't have that loyalty to the 10, 15 people who like me on Facebook or the, the 20 followers I have on Twitter. Okay, it, it, this, the, My loyalties don't lie with them. Why? Because I don't, I don't have shared experiences. I don't have shared time with them. I don't have a loyalty to them. It's not hard for me to unfriend people on Facebook. It's really not hard for me to unfollow people on Twitter. But it isn't so easy to do that in the church body. Why? Because there's loyalty. There's, there's something that brought you together. There's a bond. Listen, I, I'm not talking against having any of those things. It is good information. You can, you can follow people that bring out great information, bring you wonderful thoughts and, and things, but you don't develop friendships over that kind of stuff. And you don't develop strong bond relationships over that kind of stuff. It just doesn't happen. And so here's the thing. As much as the world says it's countercultural, the church is that much more countercultural. We need to understand that it's, it's the time that we spend together. What happened was the reason why nobody liked Levi is because the only interaction they had with Levi was at the time when they had to bring their taxes and pay it to him. And it had to stand with him. I promise you that if the, the 11 of the disciples didn't know that Matthew was a disciple, he stayed a Levite, if something happened to Levi, the, 12 wouldn't have, the 11 wouldn't have stood with him. 
and wouldn't have fought with him. But when he became a part of them, when he separated himself from the world and put himself into the kingdom of God and followed the kingdom of God, he gained a different perspective. He gained a different culture and, and a different lifestyle because he separated himself from the world. Listen, I love those people around me that I work with and that I, I come in contact with, but not in the same context that I love the church, that I love the people of God, that I love the, the family of God. There, there, there's loyalties, there's strengths there. But more than that, I like my job. I like what I do. I, I, I do like, I truly enjoy doing my work. But I don't enjoy it, and I don't have the same intensity for work as I do for the things of God. Why? Because I realize this is simply very temporal. It's something I have to do in order to provide for my children, provide for the church, provide things for the king. So the verse of that is that this is the true. This is the true kingdom of God. This is the real things. These are the things that are going to last forever. So I want to put my effort and my, my loyalties into the things of God. Not, not at the, listen, I'm, I'm a representative of Jesus Christ and the kingdom while I'm at work. So I need to do the best I can and be the best employee that I can and be a good witness. But that's, that's still just temporal things. My heart can't be so tied into it that, that it overtakes everything that I do. My heart needs to be tied to the things of God. That my heart needs to be saying, this is what I want. This is what I want to see God do. Loyalty. It's interesting if you think of Levi, you may classify him as a worldly Jew. He's a Jew. He most likely grew up in the Jewish faith, having been taught in synagogue, probably taught by those around him. And so he is still a Jew, but there's such a grip of the world on him. If I could classify what Christianity is today, it's worldly Christians. It's probably the best way I can explain it. I know they're contradictory in their terms. But they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. I, I, I watch so many people say, well, you know what, I go to church. I attend church. Yeah, that's the church I attend. That's, that's where I go. But very rarely do I hear, oh, that's what I believe. Or that's who I am. Or that's what I'm dedicated to. They have... They have a sense of, well, these are the, th this is the God box, and I'll tend to play in it, but it doesn't really affect my life. Because why? Because here's my kingdom. My kingdom first. My kingdom come. And so if God doesn't, if God and the church don't fit into my kingdom and my purpose, then I don't need them. Only when it benefits me do I, am I there. Only when it benefits what I want do I show up. Only when it benefits the things that I need, then do I show up. Then do I become a part of what, oh, you know. It's, it's the grand social club of the world. It's the denominal church. It's, it's just, it is. Why, why can they build mega churches like that. Well, the, the point is, it's because it, it, it's, it fits their kingdom. It fits their needs. I was talking to a, a brother here the other day, and uh, we were going back and forth, and somebody that he's working with is struggling with this. And, and I thought about it. They, they don't want, they want a, they want something that builds them up. Like, I'm a part of a 30,000-member church, you know? I, 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 listen, I'll be honest with you. I, I think it's crept into our churches too much. Anyway, we, we talk way too much about numbers and about whose church we attend. And Oh, I attend this person. 
Don't get me wrong. I don't want to attend anywhere else other than where God plants me. I'm thankful for my pastor, and I'm thankful for the growth that we've seen in this church. But the growth and the, and the numbers, a lot of people will say it only because it makes them feel better. If God wants us to have a thousand-member church, I want to be a part of a thousand-member church. But I, the reason to brag about a thousand-member church is not to glorify me or that I'm a part of a thousand-member church. The point is that God did that. It's his church. It's his thing. And, and not to bring glory to myself. And I find so many times when I talk to people like that, it, it's, it's the, the, the way to say I'm a part of something big. And, and I'm, look at me, you know. And it just makes me go, wait a minute. You, the, really, why are you, why, you, why do you want to say that? What, what's, the, I'm sorry, but, it, and I'm not speaking against big mega churches. If God wants us to have one, I want to have one. But I like the church that God gives us. I, I feel like we can, we can connect as a body, and as a body of believers, we can do the things that God plans on doing. And, and then in a church and such where you get, you get easily so lost just in the crowd, I, I want, I'm not, again, please understand, I'm not speaking against, I'm thankful for what, when churches grow to large sizes that are truly following the, the word of God and have an awesome impact in this world. We have some big churches in the, in the United Pentecostal Church who are doing wonderful things. They're doing great things. But the majority of churches are two to 300 people. Majority of church, well, actually, the majority of churches are about 100 people. Why? Because God needs us to be everywhere. We, can't, we, we need to be a part of his kingdom and his purpose. And I don't want to get so tied into something that becomes, I don't want to be that worldly Christian. I don't want to show up to church just because I want to expand my kingdom or my purpose. On the way in this morning, I had listened to a song, and it, it just eclipses. Uh, I, it's called uh, "More of Me, Less uh, More of You, Less of Me." It's 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 an awesome song. And the context of the song is that this young man realizes, "I built my kingdoms tall, built my kingdoms big, and I made my kingdom great." But in all of you, I realized what rubble it was. Listen, if you're a part of something that's starting to crumble, and you maybe it's a job, maybe. It's a relationship. Maybe it's uh, something other than the things of God, and it's just seeming to fall apart, and you keep trying to put You know, I, I want to caution you here. Be careful. Maybe God's knocking your kingdom down to get you out of it. I've had God destroy things in my life, and I'm going, God, that was really good, and it provided a lot for me. And realizing that God destroyed the kingdom in my life so that I would turn my away from that kingdom, and go to his. So, you know what? I've, I've watched God, and I'm going to tell on myself, I stood right here one night. And I begged God. I had lost my job. I had lost, I've been without work for almost a year, and I'm begging, God, I need work. I need this. I need this. And I need this. And God, why did you, I, you know I have children, you know, and I'm going, I don't know where It was the best paying job I had ever had in my entire life. I was making the most money I had had in my entire life. But right now, 16 years later, I realized the reason God let that fall, because it was a kingdom. It was a kingdom unto myself. I was high and lifted up. I enjoyed the notoriety, the position I held. I enjoyed the money I was making. And because I enjoyed it, I wasn't leaning on God. And then my kingdom, my kingdom was being built and not his. And so when God leveled that kingdom, you know what happened? He drew me into his. And there's things that are happening in God's kingdom I have never been able to explain. I'd be like, wow, God, I, I didn't even know that was possible. Wow, you're using me this way. Wow, God, you're allowing me to be a part of this. Not because I've done anything. I realized I'm standing in a kingdom which I had no responsibility in building. It's all God's kingdom. 
And he is taking me and putting me in places that I could never have gotten there myself. Here's another point. The reason loyalty to the kingdom of God is so important is, is one of two things. One, the loyalty to God's kingdom is a benefit in your life. Will grow you. But furthermore, and I wanna, I'm going to come back to the, the benefit to your life, but furthermore, being loyal to the kingdom of God benefits those around you. Okay? Bear with me. I had, uh, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit coded in how I speak, but I had an opportunity. I needed to talk to somebody in a position of authority, and they didn't know me, not from the man on the moon. When I called, I said, hey, I need to speak to somebody I'm from Pastor Walker's church. Listen to me. They didn't even ask anymore. They just sent me on to the next person. They connected me to who I needed to be connected to. Why? Because of the loyalty that Pastor Walker had built. It opened a door. Not because of my own doing, but because of the pastor who walked before me had been so loyal to the kingdom of God and loyal to the things of God. It opened a door. Which I, God opened it still, yes, it was God, but it was through the thing. I called my grandfather last night, and I spoke to him, and I said, Grandpa, I'm blessed because of your loyalty. Because your loyalty to the kingdom of God. You know, because of his loyalty to the things of God, I have a generational blessing. I have a generational blessing over my life. I, I can tell on him a little bit. My grandfather endured some hardships in the church. He watched churches come and go and yet stayed strong, stayed steady, stayed the course. And I benefit from his loyalty to the kingdom of God. I benefit from the loyalty of my parents who are here with us this morning. I benefit from their loyalty. I benefit from my father-in-law's loyalty to the kingdom of God. Why? Because they, they built a foundation which I realize I'm standing on. I didn't do on my own whatsoever. I'm standing on a foundation in the kingdom of God that I had nothing to do with. And I am reaping the benefits of it simply because those who were loyal before me. And here's the other thing. Who else is going to reap from my loyalty? My children. My children will reap from my loyalty. Listen, I, this world's kingdom has stood in the face of God this week. And the kingdom of God will not be moved. And so the benefit to my children is when I'm in this kingdom, the kingdom that God has established, it shall never be moved. It won't fall. They, my kids can feel safe here. My kids can, can feel safe in the kingdom of God. Why? Because there's something that, you know what? Dad, Dad must, there's got to be something precious about it because Dad spent his whole life being loyal to the kingdom of God, being loyal to the people of God, being loyal to the man of God. And so there's got to be some value in there. And my kids gain value, gain understanding, gain a footing that they didn't build. And they have a new a, a place in God's kingdom due to the loyalty that I bring. Now, it is simply the grace of God that allows us. But I have to apply the grace of God through loyalty. Listen. Part of the problem with, the, with the, the worldly church is that they say, I have the grace of God to do whatever I want and build whatever I want. And guess what? It won't stand. When the, when the, when the tides of this world come in, it will wash out all those who stood on the grace of God as being what they wanted. Here's the, here's the deal. The grace of God is not meant for me to stand on the grace of God for my own purposes. 
The reason that grace of God is here so that I can take pieces and put it into God's kingdom. I can build God's kingdom. It is by the grace of God that I'm in his kingdom. It is by the grace of God that I can build his kingdom. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. I don't have any kind of right to it. It's simply because God's grace is so sufficient for me that it allows me to build his kingdom. It's a gift to yourself. I know we're harping a little bit on this, but when you fully commit to God's kingdom, you fully commit to the greatest thing happening in the world. It is the, it is the premier thing going on in this world. All the money in this world, all the, the, the great things of this world cannot compare to God's kingdom whatsoever. They don't stand. They will not stand. This is the best thing happening. I, we lose perspective so quickly because we allow the mantra of the world to say, well, look, it, you're, you're, you're tied up. You're, you're, you're bound. You're, you're, okay. I, I'm going to steal a line from T.F. Tenney. Do you know heaven has boundaries? God said it's this long, this high, this wide, this deep. This is the new Jerusalem. It has its own boundaries. But what does it say of hell? For hell continueth to expand herself. Continueth. There's no boundaries in hell. Listen to me. When you make it to here or there, who's free? The one living in the boundary? There are boundaries. There's a reason. The boundaries are not there, and the kingdom of God's boundaries are not there to control me and to limit me. They are to free me. They are allowing me to do his work and his kingdom. And, and so when I'm here, I'm not bound by my own flesh. I'm not bound by the spirits that I, I, I have not met. I, I've I have not met. Maybe you have, but I have not. I have never met somebody whose wealth was so great that it's brought them ha true happiness and joy. I haven't met them. But I have met the grandma who has nothing but God and is completely joyous and completely free in the Holy Ghost and, and operate and just has this peace and joy about them that doesn't, wait a minute, hang on. You live off a, a, a $600 a month check, and you're happy. How is that possible? Well, it's because the kingdom isn't of hers. It's of God's. Right. And so they, they operate. See, the, the greatest lie you'll ever hear is that he's limiting you. He's not limiting you whatsoever. He's saving you. His grace Saves you. What, what, what contradiction to the world? The world, all it wants to do is grow itself. Listen, when you grow your kingdom in the world, guess what? You're really not growing your own kingdom. Bible says you will serve two masters. You will either serve God or mammon. When you enslave yourself to this world... You only further the kingdom of this world. And guess what? The benefits of the kingdom of this world are death. Our eternal damnation. What, what, what reward is that? When the kingdom of God, when I submit myself to the kingdom of God, the benefits are literally out of this world. They're so great. Listen, I can't, 
I can't explain what heaven will be like or what it won't be like. But if heaven is nearly as much close to what I've been in some powerful services, listen, I, I have danced before the Lord so much that my legs feel like they were going to fall off. And I've been up here praying people through the Holy Ghost and, and feel so drunk in the Spirit of God that I walk out going, well, I don't know if I can handle anymore. And, I just, and the next morning I wake up and I feel good. I feel better. I feel strong. I feel rejuvenated. Anytime I've given myself, I'm not talking against playing sports or anything like that, but I haven't done drugs, so I can't go there. I haven't done any of that. I haven't drank. But when I've given myself over to the things of this world, not wrong, just spent a whole day playing football, a whole day playing baseball, and nothing wrong with it. But when I wake up, I'm not rejuvenated. And the older I get, the harder it is to get out of bed. I'm like, oh, dear Lord, you're going to have to help me today. Ah, it, nothing wrong with doing that, okay? I'm not talking against you. My point is this. The benefits in the morning are a painful body. The benefits in the morning are aching joints. The benefits down the road are thing. never, never in God's kingdom. Does anything but bring me into places where I, I don't deserve. Now listen, I didn't even, the grace of God has taught me I haven't earned anything. I haven't earned a place in the kingdom of God. I haven't come to a point where I have figured out everything of God and, and I've got it all figured out. We go from glory to glory. Levi, when he was called, heard a voice. And responded, taking his kingdom and leaving it. And when Matthew comes into the kingdom of God, Matthew had taken all the world's, look, he was part of the most powerful kingdom that ever stood at that point. It seemed like if he'd stayed there, he would have all the riches he would have ever needed all the protection. But you know what happened? That kingdom fell. That's right. That kingdom came down. And he became a part of the kingdom of God. Listen, that, th what was the benefits to Matthew? Matthew walked with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew was there when the, when the Holy Ghost first fell. Matthew was there when 3,000 received the Holy Ghost in one day. Matthew was there when he healed the blinded eyes. Matthew was there. Matthew saw all great things. Part of great things. Matthew brings us the first gospel. A tax collector writing the first gospel. That's a change in kingdoms. That's a change in and loyalties. What he gained the ultimate gift was entrance into his kingdom. Like I, I hope that someday I'll be able to see thousands receive the Holy Ghost, or I'll be able to see hundreds and even thousands in this church. And I, I, I want that. But you know what? My greatest reward is. Is not seeing all that. My greatest reward is because I know him. He is my greatest reward. He is my greatest reward. To know him, to commune with the God of the universe. That's my greatest reward. I, Matthew understood something. Yes, I get to see all this, but you know what? I got to know him. And I knew him in the power of his might. I knew him. I knew Jesus. And that is my greatest reward. My loyalty to the one who saved me. My loyalty to the one who brought me into this world. 
and my loyalty to the one who can take me out. That's who I get to be with. That's who I get to commune with. I, lately, it has not been a struggle for me to be in church. You know why? Because God has changed my mindset. I get a chance to come into the presence of God and speak with God. I, when we had that revival, listen, when that prophecy went forward, that tongues and interpretation, and he said, my kingdom has come, and you've only experienced just a small part of my glory. Wow. He allowed me to be a part of a, just a tiny bit of his glory, just a little bit of his a sliver of his glory. Would you stand with me? This world and all of its systems which stand in contrary to the word of God begs for my loyalty, wants me to be loyal to it. But there's a one over here that says, I'm not begging you, I'm just asking. It's a gift. You'll be benefited. Great benefits, great things. Yes, it may cost you. But what's the cost of, a sm of your life versus eternity? Nothing. And what is the cost to know God versus giving your life? In lieu of that, it's not hard to be loyal to the kingdom of God. It's not hard to be loyal to the principles of the word of God. When I realize that I gain him. To, Paul said it this way, to die is gain. When I die to the things of the world, when God tears down my kingdoms, I gain his. Lord Jesus, I need your kingdom more than mine. And Lord, there's, there's something inside man that wants to raise himself up. But Lord, you said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so, Lord, I want to get into your kingdom where I build your kingdom. I build your, your purposes and your will, not to bring any glory to myself, but to say, all for your glory. And, Lord, when we do that, we not only bring blessings to ourselves, but we benefit all those around us. The great is your faithfulness toward us. And when we are faithful to your kingdom, your kingdom is faithful to us, and it's faithful to those around us. I thank you, God, for this opportunity. Lord, I pray a blessing over the rest of this day. Let your anointing flow amongst us. Let it be your will and your purpose and your kingdom to go forward in Jesus' name. God bless you. We're going to take a five-minute break here, and we'll be into our second session.